Well, welcome to Hillier College, everyone. My name is Gabrielle Esperdy. I am Interim Dean of Hillier College of Architecture and Design here at NJIT, and it is my distinct pleasure uh, to invite, uh, sorry, to welcome <laughs> Mayor Baraka, uh, to welcome President Tech Lim and all of the other distinguished guests who are here uh, from the city, from, uh, from the community. Um, you know, the, the final review uh, in an architecture school is, uh, is one of the most significant aspects of architectural education. And most people tend to think that the review is a culmination of a semester's work, of a year's work. In fact, a final review is really much more of a commencement. And the reason I say that is because it's an opportunity for distinguished critics like the mayor and our president and other people who are assembled here to give informed feedback and critique to the students, which enables them to rethink and reframe their work as they move it forward. And that moving it forward might just be in their, in their own portfolios, but also in the way that they continue on in the architecture profession beyond this particular studio. Um, I think that this, is, this reframing is particularly uh, appropriate when the project at hand is dealing with a specific place in a specific time. And that is certainly the, um, the, the case with the project that we have here. Uh, in this case, the place is the city of Newark. Uh, the time is dealing with the current housing crisis that we face, not just in Newark, but in the country as a whole. This studio dealing with prototypes of transitional and supportive housing, it builds on the su successful design build studio uh, that our critics ran uh, in the last academic year. But that in turn builds on a 50 year tradition here at the New Jersey School of Architecture on community engaged architecture, urbanism, and design. Uh, thank you, Mayor Baraka, uh, for coming to this. Um, phenomenal event. I hope you leave this place feeling wow on the work that our students do. This is great. And um, thank you all of you for coming. Uh, it is my pleasure to be with you today to see this incredible and impactful work that has been done through uh, this studio. Um, the work we're seeing today, that you'll see today, and I look forward to, to uh, understanding it, is a perfect example of exactly what this place embody. NGIT is a place where talent, opportunity, and hard work intersect in ways that improve the quality of life of, for people. So we're going to talk a little bit about why we're here. Charlie and I are architects, um, and we run a design-build practice. That means we like to design as much as we like to build. We actually like building probably more. Um, but as architects, uh, what we do is a commitment to the health, safety, and welfare of the general public. When you get licensed, that's what that means. Um, and for us, this idea of welfare of the general public inherently includes socially engaged design and social responsibilities. So that's our practice. Um, as students, and we consider ourselves students of our discipline, we're constantly trying to learn, but also, of course, we have our own students who we learn from. But as students, there are problems that you can look at that exist in society within academia that are very hard to look at and to resource outside of the bounds of this. So we are incredibly honored to be looking at looking issues, uh, solutions for homelessness, solutions for the housing crisis through this lens of being able to do this in the academy. And then finally, I think as citizens, you know, through everything that we do, we are citizens of a place, we are citizens of this place. And I think during the COVID-19 pandemic, as President Lim said, no one wants to remember it, but those words, shelter in place, are incredibly powerful, especially if you have no place to shelter. And that's where this studio came from. So this studio is entitled Place of Dwelling Part 2, um, as you've seen on the title slides. Uh, this studio is building upon the work of our students in the fall 2021 semester. Those students designed and built a small, budget-conscious, deployable housing prototype that was inspired by the Hope Village Supportive Housing Program of the city. Now we'd like to invite um, the Mayor's Office of Homeless Services, Lewis and Pam, to come up and talk about the Hope Village program. Uh, we're honored to have our great Mayor, Ross J. Baraka, with us. Uh, we would not be celebrating these designs for Hope Village 3 if it wasn't for the Mayor's vision, leadership, and dedication to this important work. Under, this, under his leadership, the City of Newark has accomplished so much. 
to address homelessness in our city, significant investments in services, new innovative programs, including the historic Hope Village One. Uh, to build off this momentum, the mayor charged our office earlier this year to develop a big and bold homelessness strategic plan, the first of its kind in our city, that would bring public and private partners together to harness the, the power of collaboration to end homelessness for our most vulnerable residents, moving our city forward. And we have to do it together, right? There's no way, uh, no other way to do it because isolated work will help us solve many challenges, but collective work can help us solve the biggest, including complex challenges like homelessness. It can be done. It is collaboration that's brought us here today through this partnership with the city of Newark, NJIT, and these brilliant students. We've been able to reimagine how we can ha uh, house our residents with our addresses, bringing people and ideas together to create better places and services for our community, and we're very excited about this work. Uh, finally, I'm just so grateful for the support in this room, many partners, colleagues, and friends here. I do want to acknowledge our great municipal council members. They are here, uh, Councilwoman at Large Roundtree, uh, Councilman Council, hope I'm not missing anyone else here. Uh, but uh, I, also we have members of the Newark Commission on Homelessness, Deputy Mayor Ladd, and our Director of the Health Department uh, here as well. Uh, I want to acknowledge my team uh, from the Mayor's Office of Wellness Services. Special thanks to Pamela McNeil for her support with the design and our various community partners in attendance, including uh, United Co uh, Community Corporation. Carmilla and Ms. Pringle really attended a lot of these meetings and supported this design. And finally, Janie from Hamlet Development for providing her construction management expertise at these meetings. Thank you all for your support. Your partnerships are critical in moving this important work forward. Enjoy the presentation, and we're looking forward to work with the president and, and NJIT to launch this program in 2023. Thank you. So we'd like to talk to you a little bit about our process so you understand all of the work that's been done leading up to this and well, as well understand the process our students went through. And now this really starts back in February 2021, 20, uh, as we said during the pandemic, when Charlie and I happened to stumble upon Hope One during a socially distanced walk. And we were lucky enough to see that um, the architect for Hope One was there and he was generous enough to give us and our students a tour while it was still a construction site. So our students got to see an active construction site ad hoc and of course did it safely, um, but also ask questions and really understand what this model was because it was something very foreign, foreign to them uh, and to us as well. We were also fortunate enough to then come back to the school and say, hey, you've asked us to put together classes that focus on sustainability. And again, there is no problem more unsustainable than people without homes. So we were um, fortunate enough to raise $10,000 uh, to design and build pod V1 which is uh, some photos that you see here. And then 15 short weeks later, that was in existence on our uh, green, and we could talk about the successes and the failures that we wanted to build upon from that. We were incredibly honored to see that work included in Newark 360, as well as continue to work with Chris and Lewis and the rest of the offices to understand where this type of model can fit within our city. So starting off this semester, uh, we started with a visit to Hope One as well. Uh, to get a better understanding of uh, the services that are provided there. Uh, we met with Lewis and Pam and the service providers from UCC. Then our students were tasked with going around Newark and looking at the variety of sites that the city isolated as potential sites. So they went to these sites, they documented them both from above and photographically. Um, Alongside our design process for HOPE 3, uh, the city is also uh, wrapping up the planning process for HOPE 2. Um, so we are fortunate enough to be able to witness some of that process and planning and community engagement. Um, a number of the students uh, and I went and attended a community meeting and saw that civic engagement process firsthand. Fast forward through uh, our design process to our stakeholder mid-review, where we presented three um, design options, all taking a radically different approach. Charlie will get into that a little bit later, but they're on the walls flanking your left and right. Uh, after all that hard work, we took a, a brief interlude to carve some pumpkins and recharge, uh, and then came back in November um, with the Hope One resident workshop that was hugely impactful. Um, the students will go a little bit more into that. Um, the residents 
were generous enough to share their experience, experiences with us, uh, give us feedback on the designs, and also help us to better understand the successes of Hope One and what they would like to see in future Hope Villages. And I think we just want to highlight a couple of moments from that uh, before our students talk about it. So we asked our students to develop a questionnaire for the residents um, so that they can have some takeaways as well as obviously the meeting. So this is a snippet from one of the questionnaires that came back from the residents. And we, we tried to get open-ended questions, so we thought we would get like really specific, like, hey, I want a dresser or something specific in their room. And I just want to call attention to number 10 and number 13. Both have the same answer. The first being, what does privacy and security mean to you? And then what does home mean to you? And the answer was simply everything. And I think this was a massively impactful moment for our students. Of course, the workshop was as well, but this has been hanging up in our studio ever since and has been guide a guiding light and a guiding principle for our students to understand when they come to work every day and usually every night, what they're working for. So that brings us to where we are today, uh, which is the final review. Um, and as uh, Dr. Askerdy so eloquently put it, this is not an end, but a beginning. Um, the process will continue um, starting in January, where this design um, and the presentation will be given to the community um, involved with and for those of you in the room who are not architects or, or not familiar with a design studio, um, we start, Charlie and I, at least our method is to start every studio with precedence, understanding what's come before, both historically, built and unbuilt, and of course, we had the pleasure of also having Pod as a precedent, and looking at those successes and failures and using it, that to build upon. Drawing from these exercises of precedent research, as well as the continual community engagement, the students developed a series of design iterations, starting with individual designs and working through a series of group projects, uh, culminating in the three proposals that you see on the flanking walls. And then it's design, refine, repeat over and over and over again, every day and every night until we get to here. <laughs> um, so you are not in our studio space, Lewis and Pam have been, and you, you would see essentially a ton of uh, what you would think to be garbage, but all of this paper piled up, sheets of trace, working on different versions of these models to try to get to what you will see today. Um, so what are our takeaways uh, from this process um, in the students, in the studio? The students were asked to tackle a number of practical considerations that are often not addressed in design education. Uh, these include the unglamorous concerns such as budget, security, waste management, and accessibility. Uh, the involvement of the stakeholders also meant that the students learned to present their work uh, not only to design professionals, as is typical in design school, uh, but also to people without a design background. They had to learn quickly how to synthesize an enormous amount of information and feedback, uh, sometimes feedback that was conflicting, and use this information to influence difficult design decisions with very real world consequences. Lastly, we wanted to place the studio in the context of the larger process of design research and collaboration between NJIT and the City of Newark. The students' work this semester is a key step in this process, and one that we're incredibly proud of, uh, but this is just the beginning. Uh, our hope is that this work will help to inform the ongoing project of designing a better future for all new workers. And finally, I'm going to do them now because I feel like it's going to get a little bit hectic once the students are done. Um, but we have a, a series of massive thank yous. Of course, our partnership with, with Lewis, your office, and the Mayor's Office of Homelessness Services, as well as um, the Planning Department, the Building Department. You've all been incredibly helpful during this process, and you've been so generous with your time, your communication, coming here. This is a really rare opportunity for our students and for us as well, and we just can't thank you enough for that access. We'd also like to extend a thank you to Mike Loganbill from Homes for the Homeless whose willingness to share and support us from the very beginning got us started on this journey. Uh, we'd also like to thank the various members of, of UCC, again, for their time and their generosity and, and coming here. Um, Carmela Hudson and all the, the emails, the back and forth, the visit to Hope One, um, Miss Teresa Pringle, who will forever be remembered by our students for her energy and her enthusiasm and um, everything she brought to the table. Uh, the Hope One residents, of course, um, that, that opportunity was just so incredible. We'd also like to thank, because I don't think we'd be here without the original Pod V1, the donor for that, Tom Wozneski, the managing partner of Newark Venture Partners. We really appreciate the commitment to the community here and the fact that we could align all of these people. We'd also like to extend a thank you to the broader MJIT community and a huge thank you to President Lim for being here. Um, 
We also would like to specifically thank our community here at HCAT, um, our dean, Dr. Gabriel Espedy, our director, Dario Salvo, and so many more, some of whom are listed on this page and many of whom are not. Um, we wouldn't be here without your support, guidance, and enthusiasm. The final thank you goes to our students. Um, we can't express enough how much dedication and how much work these guys have put in. Thank you, Ms. Pringle. We are so excited you're here. We just gave you a great shout out. <laughs> um, and I'm sure our students are even more excited now. Um, look, you guys, you've put in a, a ton of work on this. They've not only had to learn to actually you know, design and, and sort of build a very small scale version of this, they've had to put together a really robust construction document set. And they've also had to work with 15 other people sometimes in the middle of the night when they are tired of working with each other. They've done an incredible job, and I'm not going to delay this any further. Um, it's your time to shine, guys. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we want to thank you, everyone here again for taking time out to be with us and to listen to our presentation and our unveiling of Resilient Hope. We really appreciate you all being here. Uh, also, we want to thank um, everyone that was able to give their feedback during this process throughout the semester. Uh, especially, you want to uh, thank uh, the Office of Homelessness Services, as well as the residents of Hope Village. Their feedback, everybody's feedback, was very important and appreciated for this project and was taken into consideration and really helped us be able to take this further and make sure that we suited all the needs possible. So first we're going to begin with a brief introduction. Uh, we're going to go through our prompt and sort of what influenced our design decisions throughout the semester. We are also going to go through each of these different sections here, talking about our precedent Hope Village 1, Again, our design objectives, site and community, the dwelling unit itself, and then we're also going to take you through a day in the life of Resilient Hope. So as a studio, we are asked to envision the third stage of a developing project in the city of Newark. Uh, it will be emergency housing for people without addresses in the city. While exploring goals for our project, we looked into different codes like the Federal Housing Act to help us with different standards and compliances for our project. This helped us to get a better understanding of the size of our unit and the size of our village uh, with a minimum of a 220 square feet of livable space for the units. With this square footage and talking to the city of York as well as other research, we found that it was most efficient to have two occupants within the unit. This would allow for a better use of the amount of space that there is. And then also, uh, what was very important to us as a studio was creating a model that could be used for future villages, both with the village as a whole and the individual units. So as we understand our prompt, and not only understand designing the building and the regulations that go into it, we also need to understand the residents and the people that will be living here in Resilient Hope. So in our research and conversations with the city of Newark, we found that our demographic for Resilient Hope was mainly individuals over the age of 50, half of which may, may have a chronic health condition. This may either be mental or physical. And also, a lot of our residents might be coming in as couples, whether this is friends, romantic relationships, or other sort of just relationships that they form. This, these are relationships that are very important to these people. Uh, connections that they've made that has that can possibly be traumatic to break apart and has been a, a huge part of this project as a whole. Now we will talk about Hope Village One. This is one of our, our main precedents, which is the first iteration of the village design. Hope Village is the first located in Newark and it holds about 25 with. Uh, individuals without addresses. There are seven shipment containers that were turned into 20 units with two of these containers dedicated as bathrooms with showers. This village was created to help individuals without addresses reintegrate society. We had the opportunity to visit Hope Village and we noticed some details that were main drivers for our design. 
we observe that each unit has a bunk bed here and a small dresser. We also noticed that there were no community spaces that served the community or the village, which you will see further on that this was taken into consideration. The next part of our project that we will talk about is the design objectives. Our project in every aspect was considered through four main design objectives. Privacy, security, storage, and dignity. Each of these objectives were selected based on research and outreach, which suggested that these were the main necessities for individuals without addresses to have an in, in a potential home. When meeting with these uh, residents of Hope Village One, we were able to get a better understanding of the main of the meaning of some of these aspects of the science. For privacy, each resident should be able to have their own private space to go that isn't shared. For security, each resident should be able to have a place where they feel comfortable and safe, which translates to both the village as a whole and their individual units. For storage, each resident should be able to have a various opportunities to store belongings in places that are both shared and safely secured. And lastly, for digni dignity, each resident should be able to have a place that they are proud to call home and a place where they can feel like they are part of the community. Now we will leave you with the site and community team that will show the next part of our project. My name is Liz and this is Cooper and Jason. We worked with uh, Pat and Adina and Leslie on the site and community. So this was studying the different sites across Newark for their viability as a new Hope Village and then also designing the interstitial community spaces outside of the dwelling unit on a test site. Through a series of meetings with social workers and residents of Hope Village, we developed these goals to guide our design. They are security, dignity, community, and connectivity. These goals came directly from these meetings as well as from site analysis. We were asked to look at four sites across Newark as test cases for a new home village. Site one was in a largely industrial neighborhood and we deemed it oversized for the brief of 25 residents. Site two was in a residential neighborhood backing into a cemetery and we also deemed it undersized for 25 residents. Site three is in a mixed use commercial neighborhood and was also undersized for the required number of residents. Site four is also in a residential neighborhood and at 30,000 square feet was deemed the most appropriate scale for our brief and you'll see it through the rest of this presentation as our test case. Uh, site four has been our test case to plan our community resilient hope. The neighborhood is largely residential with mostly single or two family houses. There are a few public housing developments in the broader area. And some other things to know about the site are it's separated from downtown by a major highway, has a few schools in the vicinity, and some parks in the area. Uh, there's a few bodegas walking distance from the site uh, as a resource for the residents. And there's also two buses to downtown a short walk from the site. We also studied the communal spaces at Hope Village One. Uh, in blue, you can see the communal space, which is just a few picnic tables, and it's not weather protected and the admin space is just one half a trailer, and the entry sequence is outside past a large metal fence and a security booth outdoors. Here's a view of Hope One with the entry gate and communal space beyond. So we used our site research and information from Lewis and the Hope One community to fulfill these design goals of security, dignity, community, and connectivity, which directly translated into the design of our site on the test case of Site 4. These goals directly translates into the four aspects of our design. The fence is security, the entry with dignity, communal space, and connectivity between the residents' private dwelling units. Now we're gonna take a closer look at the fence design. This was influenced by the need for security, but also to create an element to become part of the community. The fence encompasses the entire perimeter of the site as a requirement of the village, as seen highlighted in red. While visiting Hope One, we noticed that the fence looked like a long barrier between the village and the street, and it felt like a dehumanizing threshold. 
So we designed several fence, fence options to tackle different conditions. The rear yard and the side yard will have a slitted aluminum fence, which will serve as a continuous boundary around the edge. For the fence along the street fire trench, we created two options. Option one, a dynamic fence to provide interesting and a non-scalable aesthetic. And option two, a much simpler art fence that can engage with the community. We placed the village's entry building at the center between the two fences to act as a threshold, giving the front a more natural inviting feel into the village. Here's a render where we can see the dynamic fence implemented around the entry point. The fence is made out of wooden planks and placed at various angles to give it this wavy look. In this render, we switched out to incorporate the art fence, and this was made, also made of wooden planks and painted to give a mural work. Uh, we believe that this design of the fence can be painted by local artists to engage the community with the project. All the fence elements are to be eight foot tall, and in this section, we can see the options of the two different fences. The dynamic fence on the left extends much farther out than the one of the art fence, but both fences will have a thin mesh screen behind them to help prevent any passing through of the larger openings between spigots. And as security is an important factor for our village, when designing the vents, we incorporated plenty of lighting around to provide visuals from the security guard located in the entry building and the sidewalk. We're now going to take a further look at the entry process into the village. As you can see highlighted in yellow, this is where our entry building is situated on the site, and it breaks through the fence providing that threshold into the village. As residents move along the fence, they can enter the village through the entry building, which consists of the security slash check-in, the locker system, and the community pantry. So this plan shows the entry building where the security officer is located to the right of the black arrow, which is the entrance, and further ahead is the pantry space. We wanted to create this enclosed security space because as we saw in the Hope One Village, when residents entered the village, they were screened at the front gate, which seemed um, a little bit too public, so we wanted to create a more private setting for this to occur to create a sense of dignity for the residents when they uh, go through the village. The pantry space is to provide uh, some food for the residents, but also it's available to the broader community during certain hours and times of the day. We're now going to go through several set scenarios of different people that are going through the village. The first one is going to be of a pantry user who is not part of the village, but part of the broader community they are able to enter through the security, check in, go to the pantry, take what they need, and leave. In red, we have a resident arriving home. They can go into security, check in. They are allowed to go into the pantry, grab what they need, or enter into the village. In blue, we have village employees. This accounts for admin counselors and the security officer. They also will park in the provided parking spots, walk into security, check in, and go to their locations where they are needed. In green, we have maintenance officials who can access the site through the large gated opening. This, these people will most likely be from the Newark Department of Public Works to perform various duties around the village when needed. Lastly, we have emergency services, which can access the side gate located near the parking. And this has a direct line, of, this has a direct line to get to the admin and clinic area uh, into the site. So here we have a visual of the residents entering the building. As you can see, the security present to the right side to check in. The lockers are located to the left, and the pantry space is located straight ahead. Residents will be able to pass through the metal detector located there and enter into our village. So now we are going to run you through our community buildings. Highlighted in green is our community-focused program within the site, which we decided to break into an admin building a larger communal building, and then a series of covered and uncovered communal spaces that are outdoors. Through multiple meetings with both residents, uh, service providers, as well as the city, we derived a series of program requirements that we move forward with for the communal aspects of the village. So starting with an admin office and storage space, the admin office is an open office area, as well as storage for any goods that are not food related. So this could include any sort of clothing donations, as well as any household goods. Then we have two private counseling rooms for the workers to directly communicate with residents within the admin building. And then a large group meeting space. Uh, the group meeting space came directly through talking with Ms. Pringle. 
So Ms. Pringles does many life skill classes with the residents, so we wanted to provide a space for that, as well as many other events that we have heard from different residents, as well as the workers, and that they bring in barbers, they do art nights, any sort of community events can happen within this meeting room, which is separate from the community kitchen and multi-purpose room. Uh, there is a 24-hour laundry for residents, as well as the workers to use, and then we do have a multi-purpose and large communal kitchen space as well as a series of the outdoor spaces, which we will go into in the plan. So running you through the plan, we'll start at the very top where there's the tree and a shaded outdoor sitting area. Overlooking that is the admin building, where you can see the two counseling rooms with windows that look over the shaded seating area, as well as the open office and storage, which is the area that says admin. And then connected to that is a medical and de-escalation room. So this medical room would be for any sort of low priority and low risk medical services as well as a de-escalation room with a direct line of access from the street in case any sort of emergency services would have to enter the village. Passing through the covered thoroughfare between the admin building and the communal kitchen, there is a large multi-purpose room, which you can see has the kitchen lining one wall with two tables for sitting, as well as a seating area with a television. Talking with the residents, something that one of the residents said that he doesn't have in the current Hope Village and just something that he hasn't had in so long. It's just a spot to watch Sunday football with some of his friends. So just providing something, some sort of dignity that they just haven't had in a while, such as just having a spot to throw in a game we wanted to focus on. Um, also in this large kitchen and multi-purpose room is computer access. So there is an open computer access as well as a private room. The open can be from anything for paying bills online, anything like that. And then the private room, uh, a lot of the residents do partake in telehealth as well as any sort of virtual calls with any friends and family that they have. Connected off of there is the communal laundry space as well as the meeting room. The meeting room is connected by a covered walkway to the entry building in case any sort of community meeting did want to happen within the room that can relate to the residents. And then laundry room overlooks a community garden. Um, we did not size this community garden necessarily to provide an abundance of vegetables and fruits for the residents, but more so to work with the life skills classes done by Ms. Pringle and think, thinking that if they can upkeep a garden, it could help them kind of upkeep a routine for themselves as well and work hand in hand with those classes. Uh, we will now run through the series of perspectives of the community, uh, community buildings. So here is what you would see directly walking through that entry building. You come out under a covered walkway and you can make your way directly to the large communal building, which is the double doors there next to the large glass wall. Uh, we decided to go with a large glass wall on this communal building. We wanted to make sure that the residents felt invited to be in here and invited to use it from wherever they are within the village. So there's lots of big windows and ribbon windows that work their way around all these buildings. Uh, the pergolas do connect you to the thoroughfare between the admin and the communal building. We envision that to be a major walkway for residents and workers coming into the village, whether they want to be covered going to their units in the back of site, or they need to get to the counseling rooms or the communal room. Moving to the next perspective. So here you can see the communal garden where some of the residents are growing some tomatoes in the back. Um, we provided an outdoor kitchen sink, and that is if, for any sort of outdoor sink needs. And then this communal garden also falls within a circle of units. So we wanted to put two of our main communal spaces within the circles of the units, and that was to kind of invite them into the communal spaces. Here you can see the pathway between the admin and the communal building. We wanted to really design this walkway as we envision it being used a lot to get from the front of site to the back of site. So we decided to lift the pergola and cover it to provide a covered walkway that still allows lots of light. Uh, on the left, you can see a picnic table and the shade tree in the back. So this is for a different kinds of outdoor spaces. One of the residents also said he enjoys playing chess outside with some of his buddies, so we want to provide tables for that as well as to eat outside and enjoy natural lighting. Finally, here, or here is the communal and multi-purpose room. So on the left wall, you can see the kitchen and the tables. On the back wall would be the computers. And then on the right, you can see a guy watching the Giants game. Yeah. And uh, before we move into our dwelling unit layout, we did want to show you what you would see walking through the village again. So here is that large glass wall, really inviting all the residents to use these communal buildings and have them, have them feel a connection to other residents within the village. So lastly, we're going to look at the site aggregation or just the placement of dwelling units on the site. So you can see the dwelling units highlighted in blue here. 
Um, and like Cooper mentioned, they were purposely circular uh, around the edge of the site to um, surround the community building. We wanted to break down the scale of this larger site into increasingly smaller and more intimate scale to provide a feeling of community and ownership within the site for the residents. So the dwelling units are arranged in a circle around the central community spaces, and they each have um, porch pairs which face each other, which you can see highlighted in the darker blue. You can see those facing porch pairs uh, here in this perspective, giving a smaller scale of intimacy and connection for residents. The units were also placed to provide a centralized community space um, for a feeling of visibility and security when outside of the spaces. <coughs> and even at nighttime, the lights from the porches and the community buildings allow for an illuminated site. So you can see that in this nighttime view here, um, any residents doing their laundry late at night or returning home from work late um, have ample enough light for visibility to walk to and from their pods. And we'll leave you with this image of the approach to the drawing unit, and our next group will take you into the homes of Risley Home. Thank you. design, we kept in mind the previously mentioned design objectives, which were privacy, security, storage, and dignity. These are all things we consider when choosing our own homes and our own uh, neighborhoods, and so we decided we decided to extend that to these uh, units. Here you can see an overall layout of the unit. The unit includes two bedrooms, a bathroom, a kitchen, and a shared living space. As stated before, these units are designed to house two residents. Each bedroom is lockable and has access to private storage for belongings as well as clothing. And the bathroom and kitchen with the right fixtures are also designed to be accessible for those who are not able-bodied. Um, the cabinetry that we've designed in the millwork um, also has no hardware to, to help with accessibility. And a shelving unit separating the kitchen and living space has a uh, drop leaf to allow for more prep space and create a partition between it. Storage is plenty throughout, and this was really important to us uh, because oftentimes residents come in without anything or too much stuff, and in the instance where they do bring too much, it can be very traumatic for them to part with it. So storage spaces throughout the unit allow residents to gradually do this. This is a view of what we see as we enter the unit. We're greeted with an open living space characterized by warm wood tones and a subdued palette to establish an inviting feel. On our left-hand side, there's a storage bench to hang our coats and kick off our shoes, and accented walls like the ones that encase the bathroom can be done in several colors to allow uh, for a sense of personalization and ownership, ownership of the unit. When we take a slice along the main hallway and face the entry, we can see the entry sequence from the front door to the wall storage where a resident can place their shoes, jacket, personal belongings. Next are bedroom doors that can be seen with a better view of the clerestory windows above them. At the end of the hall is a utility closet that would be locked from the resident and only accessed with a key from admin. If we take a look at the other side of this hallway space, we have a clear view of the living space, kitchen, and bathroom. The living space contains seating and mounted shelves for placing small items. The kitchen that follows has, again, that drop leaf that provides for more prep space, and it creates a small division between the kitchen and living. There is a nook that follows with shelving that serves as an open pantry for the kitchen space. Uh, windows are placed in each of these areas to allow for more daylight with added track lighting to keep the space well lit when needed. Down the hall, there's the bathroom and the storage closet as mentioned before. <laughs> this other section through the entire dwelling unit shows the relationship between the main living space and bedrooms. A lower roof provides for a cozier, more private feel for the bedrooms, whereas the higher pitched roof and clerestory windows on the other side create a grander living space. This also showcases the sequence from shared space to private space where the grand shared living kitchen space transitions into the cozy, more private bedroom space for each individual resident. Here is a view from the bedroom showcasing built-in storage space and how it would look populated with some personal items. We also did a series of daylight studies to better understand lighting with the clerestory windows and how they benefit 
the um, overall lighting of the interior space. Here we can see the daylighting of a typical south-facing unit throughout the day. From a mental health standpoint, daylight is incredibly important. Exposure to sunlight is thought to increase serotonin levels in the brain, which boosts our mood and it help, and helps us feel calm and focused. The use of clerestory windows along this wall also helps illuminate the main space throughout the day, allowing for plenty of light to be filtered throughout the unit, which also reduces the need for artificial light and in turn reduces energy consumption. So right now we're going to be looking at an image of the unit from the exterior and what a resident will experience when coming home. Um, in designing the exterior, we wanted to focus on using cost-efficient and durable materials. We ultimately chose a combination of wood siding and corrugated metal panels, with the majority of the home being clad with metal siding and accenting the porch and entrance with the wood to make for a more inviting place to be. We also thought about how to make each unit feel personal for the resident, so we completed a study of one of our main focus sites in the neighborhood and noticed how each home had a unique feel using different colors and materials, as well as dramatic roof slopes. Um, Hunter's gonna talk a little bit more about that. So our material palette for the dwelling unit consists of two mediums, corrugated metal and wood siding. The wood siding is strategically placed along the entry walls of the unit because the softer, earthy tones of wood are perceived as more inviting than the corrugated metal or other cladding alternatives. That said, the remaining exterior walls use the corrugated metal siding as it is economically efficient, easily customizable, and capable of being a resilient facade of the dwelling units. You can also see our neighborhood to porch and porch to porch interaction between the units. Grouping units, as you can see, serves to create a large, more inviting space for residents to interact with each other and with the neighborhood as a whole. These porches are complete with an extended roof and bench seating, creating a more pleasant, occupiable space. And next, we'll take you through our projected construction of an individual unit. So we first start with a concrete foundation, then adding subfloor followed by two by six frame walls and a two by eight frame roof then following the sheathing of, with using zip panels and then adding windows and cladding. And then finally furnishing the unit, making it ready to be inhabited. And finally, here you can see our budget breakdown with each unit costing roughly $120,000 per unit, including labor costs. Next, Leslie and Patsy will take you through a day in the life of a resident. Um, so much of the work you have previously seen um, is typical representation for architects and architecture students. Um, however, our closing component of the presentation uh, instead is going to include a narrative that works to infer and synthesize what the residents at Resilient Hope may experience in their day to day. We have the, used this as both a design and presentation tool throughout the semester that has helped us imagine the dwelling unit and site at the many different, ne different stages and needs of those without addresses. So our first resident is Mandy. He's 19, he's been on the street for 18 months out of aging, after aging out of foster care. After multiple interactions with outreach teams, he has finally decided to make the move to Resilient Hope. He has been a resident for two weeks. Gail is our second resident. She is 58 and has been a resident at Resilient Hope for four months. She lost a partner to COVID and is recovering from addiction. Resilient Hope has given her an opportunity to grieve and rebuild her life without her late partner. And our final resident is Gerard. He is 63 and has been a resident resident at Resilient Hope for about a year and a half. Unfortunately, during COVID, he lost his second job, which prevented him from moving into his own apartment. He is doing well at his current job and is working towards moving out of Resilient Hope. Gerard takes the bus home from Montes and gets off at the bus stop. He makes a 12 minute walk home and arrives at the entrance of Resilient Hope. On his way, he drops off some bread and empanadas that were left over from the night before at the restaurant and makes his way to check in at security. 
Once he makes it through security, Gerard heads towards his pod to get some sleep after his night shift. On, the, on his way, he passes by his neighbor, Manny, who he notices is sitting alone in his porch. It is now approaching noon, and Gail is slowly waking up after a tough night. Gail has had a hard time adjusting to life in the village and living in her pod, and spent the night tossing and turning. She quickly eats some cereal in her living room before heading to speak with Carmela in the counseling room. Gail spends an hour, about an hour with Carmela before she heads to her daily life skills class with Miss Pringle. She is feeling slightly better after her conversation with Carmela, but still is nervous for her life skills session with Miss Pringle. Today, Miss Pringle is taking the daily life skills class outside to work on the community garden. Along with Gail, three other residents, Darnell, Crystal, and Alice, are also working on the community garden. An altercation occurs between Gail and Crystal, and Miss Pringle heads to the counseling room with Gail to talk about what happened in the garden. Carmela comes to take Crystal to the de-escalation room to defuse the situation. In the meantime, Manny has taken the UCC services bus to his afternoon, doc to his afternoon doctor's appointment and has finally returned home. Before he makes his way through security, he stops at the pantry to grab some mac and cheese. He's exhausted from the day and just wants something easy. As Manny heads to his room, he runs into Gerard, who is making his way out of the community center to watch the football game and do some laundry. Gerard, remembering how lonely Manny seemed earlier and seeing how anxious he is now, invites Manny to watch the game with him and others. Manny agrees to the invitation, excited by the idea that he will spend some time with others in the village. He tr quickly drops his things off, heats up his mac and cheese, and brings it to the community kitchen to eat. In the community kitchen, Gerard is cooking up some hot dogs for himself, as well as Darnell and Alice, who have made a salad from the vegetables they harvested from the community garden. They all enjoy watching the Giants beat the Vikings, as well as the opportunity to discuss football and chat with each other before all heading off to bed. In the meantime, Gail has spent some time with Miss Pringle and Carmela, where she has calmed down from her altercation with Crystal. They discuss ways to work through conflict in the village, as well as other factors that contributed to the situation, including addressing the depression that Gail is experiencing. Carmela suggests that Gail might want to begin working with a therapist on a more frequent basis and discusses her options. As it gets later, they all have decided that cleaning up Gail's space might help her sleep better that night, and so Ms. Pringle helps her tidy up. Manny's time spent with the others has eased his nerves and he starts to feel more comfortable. He decides that before heading to bed, he's going to do some laundry that he has neglected since his arrival to Resilient Hope. On his way, he runs into Miss Pringle and she helps him finish his laundry before she heads out for the day. And Manny heads to bed feeling better about tomorrow. Our goals for Resilient Hope are that through the incorporation of security, privacy, dignity, community, and connectivity, we can contribute to the mission of providing the resources and framework to shelter residents without addresses, along with the services needed to stabilize their lives in transition towards permanent housing. And this concludes our presentation for Resilient Hope. This has not been working too well. Um, so uh, we will eventually open it up for, for general comments. We have members of the faculty here as well as some invited guests, but I think first we'd love to have um, Mayor Baraka come up and give your comments. Thank you. Just a round of applause to you guys for the work that you've done. <laughs> Extremely thoughtful. Very thoughtful and the research and everything that was involved in it is, uh, you know, great and, uh, you know, made me think uh, that the faculty and staff here are doing a great job in making sure that you have the resources and access to the community that you need to be able to make these kinds of decisions uh, that you made today. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, the way I have to think about it is how many of these can we actually do? And, and that's important for us uh, because uh, whatever we do, we have to do to scale. Uh, it's not like, uh, you know, just a project for us. We have to actually put people in them and, you know, have people stay in them. Uh, you know, our point in time count, last time we had over a thousand uh, people that were homeless in our city. We represent the largest portion in Essex County. 
Uh, I think it was uh, over 100 that were unsheltered, in fact. So we, uh, you know, this is very serious and intractable issues that we're dealing with every single day. So I'd like to thank first all of the partners that are involved, of course, Lewis and his department and the homeless services and the work that they're doing every single day, UCC, the Homeless Commission, uh, all of our council people. Uh, you know, this is not an easy issue. Uh, people in the community, everybody wants to do something about homelessness, but just don't want to do it by them. And so we always, and, and I credit even our community meetings and our pushback that we get for giving us the insight to be able to, to do it differently, to make it look different, to make people in the community feel comfortable with what's happening uh, in their community and in their neighborhood. And this, I think, is brilliant and beautiful, and I don't see many people uh, on its face uh, that could actually say that this is not an attractive site, uh, that this is not, uh, you know, efficient and effective for the folks in our community. Um, people believe when they're talking about folks without addresses that they're talking about people who don't live in their community. But they actually do live there. They just don't live in a house. Right? They live in back of people's houses, uh, in the back of commercial spaces, and under bridges, uh, and laying in parks. They have a, uh, a myriad of different issues that we try to address all the time. So I appreciate that, and I just wanted to give that kind of perspective and context of how important and serious and urgent these issues are. And so we're incredibly grateful uh, that they, we were able to cooperate and collaborate with the university, because that's what the university is supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's exactly what the university, it is probably, uh, you know, as uh, you know, the president uh, alluded to, the Polytechnical County University is probably the one of the only few that we have uh, in this area. Uh, there's very few in the country. Uh, and so for us to have it in our backyard is amazing. It becomes even more amazing when it's useful. Right. Right. When, when, when we're able to use the students and the faculty and the research and the minds and the brilliance and creativity of the people here to actually benefit the residents of our community and in turn benefit the entire state because if this pops off you know everybody's gonna copy it right uh, and, uh, you know everything that we do in Newark people watch us good and bad so you know hopefully they'll take this as something good and, you know it'll reverberate throughout the state and people will use it uh, in a way that's beneficial uh, to, to, to folks who need it desperately Housing is the number one issue in the country. Mm. I don't care nobody tell you, housing is the number one issue. So working around this uh, is incredibly important. If you can make it more affordable and more accessible, uh, it, it becomes uh, you know, something that cannot be repeated, and, I, and, 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 and we love that. Last thing, you know, the president, you know, who uh, I'm growing fond of, you know, every time I hear him speak, talks a lot about collaboration. That's what we talk about at the city. Uh, because we move heavy objects, and that's really why collaboration is important for us, because we move heavy things. Uh, and just the physics of it, I think that's important at NJIT, right? <laughs> the, the physics of it, you know, when you, when you move things that are heavy, you need leverage, and you need help, right? So I could, I could move this small object by myself, but the bigger the object becomes, the more help I need, right? Because I'm just not strong enough, and sometimes not smart enough to move these objects, but I don't have the right leverage. So it's necessary to get as many people on it as possible. That's why collaboration is incredibly, incredibly important. Because the work we're doing here is, in some instances, immovable. People believe that not only is it difficult to move, that it's impossible to move. And so what we've done here today is prove that we can move something that others have thought were impossible to move. We're moving it today. Uh, and we're going to go back to that community. Uh, that it was very difficult to put our Hope Village One in, and we're gonna show them this iteration, uh, hopefully, uh, and think about how, how it makes sense, and, and, and see what that, and maybe bring a couple of you guys up there. It'd be a, it'd be a great a experience for you. They should, they should give you an A++, plus plus. You know, I got you, you come with me, you'll be okay, trust me. Getting in, getting out of there, everything, I got you. But uh, you know, I think it'll be an incredible experience just for you, a real-time experience. And selling what I think you've done, which is a, a, a masterful and incredible and thoughtful job. So I thank you again, all of you, uh, for the work that you did and the presentation was 
incredible as well. So God bless you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah good afternoon. Uh, Councilman Council uh, from the South Road of Newark. Uh, a little upset that uh, we, we're not getting this project over there, but we work continuously <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and very ferociously to uh, you know make sure that this happens. Uh, first, I would uh, definitely want to commend you guys uh, for the tremendous work that you've done. And uh, as uh, the young lady said back here, I think you you should pause and reflect uh, because sometimes when we do this kind of work, uh, we don't look at lives that we save, the generational impact uh, that it's going to have. Uh, and that one day somebody's going to tell a story uh, about how they were a part of what took place here and how it changed and transformed their life. And some way you will be somewhere away not realizing that the work that you've done paved the way for a testimony for someone else that life has been saved and a generation that has been discovered. So you should uh, really uh, take kudos for this and to the leadership uh, of this institution and for everyone uh, is around to continue to, you know, full thought and, and, and uh, make sure that that is a good, good uh, acrimen to, to begin what happens because uh, transformation and innovation uh, in these times is going to be critical uh, in helping to continue to grow and develop the city as uh, the mayor talked about. And so I'm just super excited about uh, the work that you've done there. And you know, to me, uh, the cost variable, uh, be it if it's a bamboo floor or a high and high cost roof, right? What it does is it lets, lets those individuals know that come in there that their life still matters, mm. right? And it let them know that they can change sure. and be consistent about it. Right? So thank you.